We're beginning our new sermon series this morning on Out of Egypt. And it's hard to get out of a mess without first examining how we got into it. You know, I love the stories of deliverance, especially in the Bible and in people's lives. Someone whose life was a mess, and it was broken apart, and it was, or was crumbling apart, and God comes in and he does this great delivering work. I love those stories, whether it's something where alcohol had just ruined a person, and God comes in and saves them and changes them, and they never touch another drop, and the things that were broken get restored. I love that. Or when someone's just overwhelmed by bitterness or lust or anger or any of those things that can, can grab a hold of somebody, and you see God change them. I love those stories. But those stories have a beginning. We know about the ending, but those stories have a beginning. And it's not always what we think it is. How do those stories begin? We're thinking about the deliverance of God's children out of the slavery when they were in Egypt. But many people today, they wake up and they find themselves in this moment and they realize how terrible of a situation they're in. Has that ever happened to you? You wake up and you realize things are bad. And it feels like it happened overnight. But if you were to look back with some perspective, if you were to look back with some detachment, you'd probably find that it was a slow thing that happened. And you didn't notice it until some event happened, right? If, if you've been in your house before and you're walking around your house and nothing seems amiss and you go outside for something or you run to the store and you come back in and you notice a smell, you didn't know it before you left, <clears throat> maybe it's the trash can. And you think, well, the can's not full yet, but something in there has turned. And now I can smell it. You couldn't smell it before, but you could once you left and you came back in and you got some perspective. Or you opened the refrigerator and you opened it a bunch of times, but this last time you opened it, something went bad. And you could smell that it had gone rotten. Now, it was going bad before you smelled it, but it was only once you did you realized it. What if in our lives, as things are sliding, as they may even be rotting in some cases, what if we could get to it and realize it was happening before it has to go completely rotten and start stinking everything up? What if we couldn't just tell it was there, but if we could stop it from happening? Well, as we look at God's great deliverance for his children, uh, the children of Israel out of Egyptian slavery, we see how they first got there and some things that you and I can learn about as things subtly go bad. We're in Exodus chapter 1, if you have your Bibles with you. In Exodus chapter 1, and verse number 1, the Word of God says, Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. <clears throat> and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Let's pray together. Father, may you open our understanding in this hour. 
Give me clarity of thought and speech. May your spirit work. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You have almost 1,700 years before the Lord Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. He didn't begin there, but when he would be born there, you're going back quite a ways. And we're hearing about how God had chosen a man, and from that man and his descendants, he was going to make a nation, a people for himself. That man's name was Abraham. And now we are down a couple of generations from Abraham to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And there's a lot, there's an amazing story around the life of one of Jacob's children named Joseph. And that is intertwined with how the children of Israel got themselves down into Egypt. Because when they came in, it wasn't bad. They didn't decide one day, hey, let's go be slaves in Egypt. Nobody does that, and they didn't do that. In fact, something slowly went bad over time. You see, Israel, the, the newly named Israel, was Jacob, was sojourning with his family in Canaan, and he had many sons. How many of you came from a big family? You came from a big family? Well, this was a big family, and there were many sons, and one of his sons was named Joseph. And Joseph was hated by his brothers. There's no fighting like family fighting, is there? right? It hurts more, it gets hotter, it gets angrier, and then you've got to see them later that day, or you have to see them at the next family picnic. There's nothing quite like family fighting. Look in, in Genesis chapter 37. Now, you probably said at some point that you hated your brother or your sister, if you had any siblings. You probably said that, but they meant it. In Genesis 37, in verse number 4, it says, and when his brethren saw that their father loved him, meaning Joseph, more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. There was favoritism. And everyone knew that Joseph was daddy's favorite. And they hated him for it. Now, you probably hated your siblings, but you've not sold them into slavery yet, right? That hasn't happened. You've had that moment where you were like, I wish I was an only child. Well, they were going to kill him. They found an opportunity, they were going to kill him, but a chance to make a little bit of money came by and they sold him into slavery. They sold their own brother into slavery. And the story goes that he was taken as a slave down to Egypt. And though his life was hard and rough and many things were done to him that ought not to have happened by our reckoning, all of it was done in order to put him as second on the throne in Egypt. He would be only one under the king, Pharaoh himself, and he was going to be elevated through this. And many people meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. His brothers meant it for evil, selling him into slavery, but God meant it for good. When he was sold as a slave into Potiphar's house and behaved himself wisely and became over all that house, and Potiphar's wife wanted him, and when she got turned down by godly Joseph, and she lied about him. She meant it for evil that he would be put away for humiliating her, but God meant it for good. And then he was stuck down in a prison. And though he was in that prison, he still prospered no matter what circumstances he was in because God was with him. And he was forgotten about. But eventually, he was remembered at the, just the right moment. At just the right moment. And he came and performed a great service for Pharaoh. They realized how special of a man Joseph was. And they elevated him to the prime minister, the second in command, whatever you would call that, in Egypt. Look at what they said about him in Genesis 41. In Genesis 41, in verse number 38, this is what they said about Joseph. <clears throat> and Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. God moved them there, and there was much that happened. And just talking about Joseph's life makes me want to preach through Joseph's life. An amazing, an amazing man who dealt with hardship in the right way. But what ends up happening is a famine comes, and Joseph is warned about these things through one of Pharaoh's dreams. Egypt sets aside all sorts of food for the bad time when the famine comes. 
Remember, a famine is a time when there's little food and people go hungry and it just keeps going on and on and on. And so that's what happened. And wouldn't you know it, his brothers that sold him into slavery eventually ended up coming down and having to buy food from him. They didn't realize it was him until he revealed himself. They thought he was just another Egyptian guy. Well, there was repentance. There was uh, healing that happened there. And because the rest of the world was in famine, Egypt, said, uh, Egypt allowed Joseph to bring his family down, set him up in a place called Goshen, and they had a good life for a while. They had a good life. They came into Egypt as the family of Joseph, the man who saved the kingdom. Joseph was the one who didn't just save Egypt from the famine. He made Egypt once again the superpower of the region because everyone brought their cattle and their money and everything to buy food out of Egypt. And so things were good for a while. But then he passed away. It says back in our passage in Exodus chapter 1, it says, And Joseph died and all his brethren, and all that generation. In, in Genesis chapter 50, in verse 22, we get a little more detail on what this looked like. It says in Genesis 50, in verse 22, And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, and the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. Isn't it interesting that when they talk about Joseph's legacy, they don't talk about how much money he had. They don't talk about how great of a house he lived in or how many head of cattle that he had. You know what they talk about? His children. They talk about the great blessing that he had of seeing his children's children's children. You know, we can learn a lot from his example here that what's really important is the people and the relationships in our lives and not all of the toys and the treasure that people store up. In verse 24 it says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. You see, this promised land was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that one day God would give them this amazing place to live. They were nomads until the prom well, the promise was given, then they were brought down into Egypt, but one day God would bring them to the land that was promised to them. It says, And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. He's saying, one day, you're going to go back. You're going to go back to where we're supposed to be, to where God promised us. This is not our home. We're not going to stay here forever. This is a temporary stop. And I want you to take my remains with you so that I can be buried in the right spot. Verse 26, so Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a, co a coffin in Egypt. Jump back to Exodus 1 and verse 6. We already read it, but I want to notice that word generation. And Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. You know, things have to be passed from generation to generation. Things have to be passed from generation to generation. And sometimes things that ought to be passed are not. They're, they're, the legacy does not continue. The teachings aren't given. They don't continue on. And then you end up with something like what happens later when Joshua is at the helm. And Joshua and his generation, this is after Moses, after the promised land, they pass off the scene. They die. And it says, and there arose a generation that knew not the Lord. How did that happen? One did not pass it on to the next. One didn't pass it on to the next. So we have a changing of these generations. And over these generations, it looks like things were going well. In verse 7, the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Not bad from 70 people going to the place where the land was filled with the children of Israel. God so blessed them. But as seasons change, circumstances change. Eventually, verse 8, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Egypt owed much to Joseph. They owed not just their continued existence through the famine, but their great wealth and power because of all of the money and the prestige that was brought into because of that. But after generations came, 
People used to know Joseph as a household name. Oh, we know who he is. Absolutely, we know who he is. And then it was, yeah, I heard stories about him. He died, didn't he? And then it became, yeah, there was some guy from, who was a prisoner and was a slave, and he, he did something for somebody. And then his family, they all still live in Goshen, right? And then eventually it came up where the new king didn't feel any obligation whatsoever to who had helped them. I love it when people remember who it is that helped them. I, rem I love it when people remember along the way and they, they take time to thank them. Do you remember somebody that invested in you and brought you along? Isn't that great? Can you think about where you'd be if they hadn't? Can you think about how different your life might be now if someone had done that earlier? I can think about a pastor who took a lot of time for me when I was a college student down at Ohio State. His name is Dan Wolven, and he took me aside, and I was a mess and didn't know anything about the Bible, and he took painstaking efforts to help clean up all of my uh, worldly thinking that was not going to help me in my walk with God, and I was a mess, and he was so patient with me. I'd show up to our Bible studies looking like something that was dragged through the dirt, as it were, and um, he was just so patient. And you probably had someone like that in your life. There was a, an elderly couple that took me to lunch almost every Sunday when I was a college student. We'd always go to Olive Garden, and they would always order the same thing every time, and every time I'd have to hear about how the onions smelled like body odor in the salad. I had to be reminded of that every time. See, now you're never going to be able to eat that salad again, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but, that, but they made sure I came to church. They were my adopted grandparents. If I didn't show up, they were going to come after me, right? In the best of ways. Let's not forget the people who've invested in us. If someone like that, you still have the opportunity to thank them, go thank them. Write them a note. Write them a letter. Pick up the phone, give them a call, maybe even invite them out for coffee. Let them know that you appreciate them. They no longer appreciated what Joseph had done for the country. And they got fearful, verse number 9. And he said unto his people, the new king did, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. Just a note here, that wisely, not the good wisely. This is the sneaky wisely, when someone is clever, when someone is shrewd, and they know how to set someone up so that they can take advantage of them. That's what this man was advising. Lest they multiply and it come to pass, when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. He says, here's what I'm worried about. There are so many of them, there's so many of them, that if one of our enemies come to attack us, they're going to flip sides. They're going to jump ship. They're going to commit treason because we treat them so poorly. We treat them, it says, lest they get up out of the land. They didn't want them to leave because they were doing all of the jobs that the Egyptians didn't want to do. The Egyptians didn't do certain things with taking care of cattle and livestock, and that was considered a low job, and the Israelites were perfectly fine to be shepherds. That wasn't something that bothered them. They, they weren't allowed to be with them in the Egypt proper. They were in Goshen, but they were their workforce, and they were second-class citizens, and they liked them just where they were, but the problem was there were so many of them. God blessed despite this. So here's the plan, verse 11. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses, they enslaved them fully. That's what a taskmaster is. It's a slave master. It's the whips. It's the chains. It's the beatings. It's that if you don't do this, this is what's coming down on you. They were so worried that they might rise up against them that they ground them down into the ground so that their eyes would always be cast downward so they could never look up or look around and pose any threat. Things were good when they came in, but slowly they turned over the generations. And once who was welcomed in as honored guests now are being put into slavery. But God did not forget about them. It says in verse 12, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Can you believe these people? Can you believe? We've done everything we can to try and beat them down. And do you know what happens? They just keep growing. They just keep being blessed, despite all of our efforts to destroy them. So, like it says before, they, they built them these treasure cities. 
And so they were building and hauling and doing heavy labor in the, the burning desert sun. And they built these treasure cities. You got any treasure cities? I don't have a treasure city. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that... What, what amount of money do you need in order to have a treasure city? Where, where does that begin? Because this was the place where they put all of their wealth and their gold and their jewels and everything that they wanted to show off and keep safe. Isn't it ironic that the pharaohs would be buried with so much of their wealth, only to have all that wealth stolen by grave robbers later on. You see, the superstition in Egypt was you get buried with your treasure and you get to take it with you in the afterlife. And in fact, you could have your servants go with you. Your best servants, when the pharaoh died, if you were one of the best servants, they killed you and buried you with them so you could serve them in the afterlife. You could even have your cat killed and embalmed, and sent ahead under the afterlife. Isn't that a great motivational factor? If you're a really good servant to Pharaoh, I mean, if you really kill it and knock this job out of the park, we're going to kill you. You kill it, we kill you, we bury you with the Pharaoh. Not, not really great incentive to perform. Well, the sad thing is, all of those riches were still there when these explorers and grave robbers found the tombs of all these Pharaohs. How much of it did they take with them? They didn't take the pharaohs, they didn't take any of the riches. The grave robbers got all of it. Maybe some of the archaeologists got it. And, and just so you know, this mindset of having the most toys and getting as much stuff and making a name for yourself, it's just so appropriate that we find that in Egypt. You see, the Bible teaches us things directly, and it teaches us things indirectly. Egypt, when we look back at God's interaction with the children of Israel and Egypt, Egypt is a picture of the world. And when we mean the world, when the Bible uses that term, the world, and it's in the negative sense, it's talking about the whole godless way that people live outside of God's teachings, right? It's a godless system. They leave God of how they, out of how they think. They leave God out of how they speak. They leave God out of how they act. And so, you know, you've seen the bumper sticker maybe that says, he who dies with the most toys wins. Anyone ever seen something like that? Heard something like that? Well, let, let me amend that for you. He who dies with the most toys is still dead. You don't get to take it with you. It's just like Egypt to try and teach that because that's, that's the method of, that the world says. But you know what they celebrated in Joseph's life was the people. You know what you can take with you into the afterlife? people. And it's by introducing them into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's, it's, praise God, it's, it's not by embalming them and putting them in your tomb. It is through leading them to a life-giving relationship with the Lord. So they had them build these cities, and it still wasn't enough. And so in verse 13, they decided to put it on harder. And the children, excuse me, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. Do you still have that old cowbell-shaped cheese grater in your house? How many of you, you still have that cowbell shape? You can't clean that thing. You've got to get a wire brush up to your tools from downstairs to try and clean that thing. I don't know why we use it. But you grab that block of cheese, and you set that thing down, and you go to town grating it. Have you ever slipped and caught a knuckle? Right? And you think, ah, what, what if your whole hand had gone down it? That's what that word with rigor means. They were being ground down. They were being graded off. They said, it's not working. Let's do it harder. Isn't that dumb? It's not working. Let's do it harder. You know, they could have seen the children of Israel and said, no matter what we do to them, they prosper. What is it about them? Maybe there's something we could learn here. Maybe it's their God. Maybe it's the way that they live. Maybe we ought to look deeper into that. And they're like, nah, more, more taskmasters, longer hours. Does it ever shock you that people that saw Jesus and were against him refused to believe even after they saw the miracles? How stubborn they were. They just dug their heels in and they said, no, I'm not going to. Yeah, I saw him heal that man with the withered hand, but I'm not going to believe. I'm going to get angry at him because it's the Sabbath day. You know, oh, I, I saw him stop that funeral and raise that child back to life, but you know what? I'm not going to believe. You say, what more do you need? I mean, you just saw it. What more do you need? Well, they saw it, and they refused. They never even thought about adopting their God. 
And so they did it harder. And their lives became bitter, it says in verse 14. Look at that. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. So they were constantly putting mortar, they were building, putting the bricks together and taking care of the animals and crops. And all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor, just grating on them. I want you to notice how it began and how it ended. It began looking like a good thing, but it ended in what it calls hard bondage. Bondage is slavery. You say, what does that have to do with you and me? Right? That, that's, a, that's a pretty good question. This is the background for God's great act of deliverance. That whole theme of out of Egypt, that's the idea. God's going to deliver and rescue them. But until we get there, what, is, what does God have for you and me? There's, there's a few things. There's a few things that I think we ought to look at. The first thing is, let's not mistake this world for home. Let's not mistake this world for home. Joseph was very clear. He said, someday God will visit you again and take you back out of here to the place where he promised. You don't stay here. And when you go, promise me, he said, promise me you'll take my bones because I don't even want my bones left here. Let me ask you a question. Was, was Joseph there with his bones? No. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. More we can be said about that. But he was not there. But he didn't even want his bones left behind. That's how much he knew he didn't belong there. There was something better for them out there. Out there. They were only in Egypt for a time. And as believers, I want you and I to know we don't belong here. So don't try to belong here. That doesn't mean that we're not in this world because we live here. This is where we do our work and where we raise our families and where we do ministry. We're in it, but we're not of it. We don't belong to this world. We belong to heaven and we are just passing through. And something that causes great heartache is when we mistake this world for our home. We, this is where we can do great things for God, where rewards can be earned and sent on ahead, where we can invest in eternal things. But this is not the end of the story. This is not all that there is. But so many people find themselves in a place where they've buried themselves so deep, their roots have gone so deep here, that when it comes time to move on to the next, they grieve. I can, I can think of a time when I was a young man uh, in my early 20s, and I was thinking about, you know, the Lord Jesus and him coming back, and I'm like, could you hold off a little bit? I'm not, I, I, you know, don't come back right away. Did you know that the Bible promises that the Lord Jesus is going to return? You know, you look around this world and you say, this is so broken, this is so messed up, there's so much hate and anger and violence and just terrible things going on. You say, when is somebody going to come and do something about this? The good news is God is coming, and he does have a plan, and he is going to set everything right. That is going to happen. But when I was a young man, I didn't want him to do it right away. Because I wanted a chance to do a few things in this world. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have kids. I wanted to, to work the, the job that God had called me into. I wanted to see some stuff, experience a few things. But isn't it funny how the longer you live and the more broken you see this world, you're more quickly to agree with the Bible and say, Yay, even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. You're like, this, this, is, this is bad. This is bad, and I'm not so eager to, to stick around anymore as I used to be. When it's time to leave, we should rejoice. The crazy thing is, the children of Israel were delivered by a miraculous act of God. God broke the power of the Egyptians with miracles and plagues and signs, and they, they went out free. But it wouldn't be long when they ran into some hardships out there, and you know what they did? They're sitting around these cook fires, and they're thinking about how they don't have any food, and they had food back in Egypt, and they're like, oh, were we back in Egypt? Oh, wouldn't it be good to be enslaved again? We have left that. That is not our home. The second thing is beware the bondage of the world. Egypt is that picture of the world, and the Exodus is a picture of God delivering us from the world and into a victorious Christian life, a walk with God where we are in his strength, in his power, enjoying his blessings, right? That's what the picture is. So the problem comes when Christians still 
want what Egypt has to offer. And we look back and we say, boy, I hate that we had to give that up. And they sat. They sat there. The, the children of Israel, having been delivered from being slaves, graded and ground into the ground. And they said, oh, man, it was, it was kind of good back there, wasn't it? I kind of like some of that. And you see, the danger that we face when we look back at those things, back at the world, the things that the way that they thought, the way that they spoke, the way that they did things, and we kind of think, oh, that was good, that was fun. Don't you remember when the guys and we did this, or all the ladies we got together, and man, we were so wasted and we did this, and I remember when I pulled it over on this guy and I got, and we talked like that. It looks good going in. But one day you'll wake up, and what was a tool for your own pleasure, your own amusement, or your own way to get ahead, now is your master. Now is your master, and it's taken things from you. It was supposed to give you things. It was supposed to, it's, and it's not going to be that big of a deal. I just need a little drink at the end of the day. To, I mean, there's so much stress and so much going on in the kids, and just, it's just, just a little drink. Something to take off the edge. But then one becomes two. And two becomes three. And one night becomes two nights. And two nights becomes three nights. And before you know it, you can't go a night without taking the edge off. All of the edges off by how much you drink. And what started out as something, this is just going to help me get through, has now become your master. And as soon as you say, I want to do something for God, I want to change, I want to be better, it's like the devil just snaps his fingers and you go right back to whatever it is he got his hooks into you with. It looked good on the front end, but it wasn't. Group of friends, young people, group of friends that you, you want to be accepted by because they're the cool kids, they have something that you want, they're the ones that you're around all the time, and you think, if I could just, if I could just get them to accept me, I'm going to have to do a little bit, I'm going to have to kind of hide the fact that I'm a Christian. I'm going to have to do some things, but I just want that, or I want his attention. I want her attention. And I'm going to have to do this if I want to get that, and it's going to be good for me because I'm going to get them. And before you know it, you're so far down the line, you wake up and you're like, how did I get here? How did I get here? So much heartache has come because people that are believers marry someone who's not a believer, and they have vastly different values about how life should be done. And generally what happens is the non-believer pulls the believer away from God. And they wake up one day, and they're like, how did I get here? This is, I went to school for this, so hold on. You know how saved people end up marrying unsaved people? They date them first. I went to school for that. It starts off as simple, but it becomes something much, much worse. I've got great news. If you find yourself back in Egypt, there's a deliverer. There's a deliverer. That's the last thing is to look for a deliverer. All the hardship, all the suffering, all the toil was truly terrible that happened to the children of Israel. But they had a deliverer coming. And it just wasn't Moses. It was Moses' God. And you may say, I am in a hard place. Maybe you've made it yourself. Maybe you've even made it yourself. Our God is so good. He doesn't just deliver us from the bad things that just pop out of the blue. He rescues us from the messes that you and I make ourselves. There is a deliverer who has come and is waiting to deliver you. You see, God became a man without ceasing to be God. And he lived a sinless life and fulfilled God's requirement, a requirement you and I couldn't fulfill. That was the Lord Jesus. And when he died, he laid down his life. He was not murdered. It was not taken from him. He laid down his life to pay for our sin, a sacrifice that could cover our sin against God. You see, we've all sinned. God says, do this good thing. And we said, I'm not going to do that. God says, don't do this bad thing. And we do it anyway. That's sin, and our sin separates us from God in this life and in the life to come. And God looked at how we were setting ourselves up for eternal torment to be separated from God, and he said, I still want them. And the Lord Jesus came, and he laid down his life 
to make a way back to God. You see, God couldn't just sweep all of our sin under the rug and pretend it didn't happen. It had to be paid for. And so the Lord Jesus paid it for you and for me. And he did not stay dead when he died for us. He rose from the grave, proving that he was who he said he was, and he has the power to overcome death and hell and the grave. And he broke the back of the world's superpower and set his people free. Whatever it is today that you need delivered from, he is more than able to break its power over you. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, there may be a, a myriad of things that you think, I need, I need to get away from, from drinking or drugs or pride or fighting or anger or lust or um, greed. or You think, I need to get away from these bad habits in my life. No, there's a God who wants to deliver you from your sin and give you new life. Not just a change of behavior, but new life. He wants to deliver you out of it. And it's yours today. The deliverance is there. And the question is, how long will you sit under the grating and the grinding of this world down on you and your soul before you'll come to God for deliverance? Christian? Believer? Is there something that you thought looked good at the beginning and you got yourself into it? And now you're on the other side of it and you feel enslaved by it and you say, I've got to get out of here. How are you going to get out of here? If you could have done it on your own, you would have done it by now. The good news is there's a deliverer for that too. Whatever stronghold there is in your life, whatever castle the enemy has built on your territory that you need torn down and some people expelled out of your life, figuratively speaking, you have a Savior that is more than able and ready to do that. And who is that deliverer? It's God himself. The Bible says, therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment? In our church, we have what we call a time of invitation where we invite you to act on what it is that God has spoken to you about. If you are here today and you're not really a church person, you're not really a follower of Jesus, and maybe you've been invited here by a friend or you just stopped in, maybe, maybe you're watching or listening online uh, to this live or maybe live streamed or, or archived later, and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, but you want that deliverance today. God has shown you your sin and your need for a Savior. And today is the day when you break free, when God breaks you free. I want you to know that you can trust Christ today, right this moment. In just a moment, we're going to stand and, and sing. People will be praying. I'm going to be down here at the head of this aisle. You can just slip out of your seat and come and let me know and say, Pastor, I want to know for sure my sins are forgiven. I want to be saved. And someone will take you off privately, a gentleman with a gentleman, a lady with a lady, and they'll show you from the Bible how simple it is to pray and ask the Lord to forgive your sins and to be your Savior. Maybe you're watching or listening online. I wasn't, I wasn't in church when I believed on Christ. I was at the side of my bed as an 18-year-old young man. And I knelt down at that bed, and I knew so little about the Bible, and I knew so little about God, but I knew this. And I prayed this prayer, and you can pray the same thing. The prayer will do nothing for you unless you believe it. But this is what I prayed, and you can pray it in your heart right now. I said, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin must be paid for. But I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. Forgive me. Be my Savior. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed and no one looking around. I want you to know if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God has promised that he will forgive your sins and save your soul. He put himself out there. He put himself on the line. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If that's you today, if you prayed that for the first time to trust the Lord, with every head bowed and every eyes closed and no one, no one looking around, just between you and me and God, and I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you, would you just slip your hand up and say, I, I trusted Christ today. I, I prayed that prayer. Anybody like that today? Thank you. Amen. Maybe you're at home and you did that. 
I'm so glad you did. What a wonderful new life you've taken steps into. Let us know. Reach out to us. We want to be a blessing to you. Christian, do you feel enslaved in some area of your life? Has something gotten out of control? Started off okay, and then it just... You look at it and you say, God, deliver me. God, deliver me. I don't need to know what it is. But you're asking the Lord to do a delivering work in your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just between you and me and God, I want to pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and say, God, deliver me from this. Anybody like that today? Amen. Amen. God, deliver me from this. I want to be free from this way of thinking or this way of speaking or acting. Anybody else? I want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. This altar here is open here as a place of prayer. If you want to give something in your own heart over to the Lord, you can pray right there in your seat. Maybe you've never followed the Lord in baptism or you want to join this church as a member. This is the time to come. Father, be glorified through our obedience in this time. Work in hearts as only you can. In Jesus' name.